This is the I'm Possible Project Show, where we interview real people who have achieved incredible feats in the face of overwhelming odds, showing that impossible is just the state of mind and that anything is possible. I'm your host, Joshua Rivedal. Today, in episode 19, a photographer, counselor, and advocate walk into a room. I talk to Nate Morrell. Let's jump right in. And Nate is a social worker and a perpetual work in progress. He spends his time growing resilience, eating salads, and talking to people at Stockton University's Assistant Director of Counseling Services and the Active Minds Advisor. Over the last five years, Nate's work has evolved from crisis intervention to prevention focus. Guided by a broken, open heart and deep solidarity to others who suffer, Nate aspires to use his life to serve and to love others into wellness. And I've seen this firsthand. I got a chance to work with Nate. I spoke at Docton a couple years back, and so we've just kind of stayed in touch and have seen each other around the U.S. a couple of times. And so I am so glad to have Nate on the show today. Nate, man, thanks for joining me, dude. Appreciate it. Uh, it's an honor, and Josh, I'm a huge fan of how you use your vulnerability, you know, through all of your amazing artistic talents, through theater and, you know, writing and podcasts now, and just, you've you've been an inspiration for me of how I can um, inspire to use my story and vulnerability um, to help pull other people up who are in the midst of, of hell, and, um, and it's just, I'm so grateful to share this time with you. So thank you for, for inviting me. Oh man, my pleasure. And that, that means a lot to hear you say those words and, um, you know, just, just however I can be of service to you and to the universe and to the, everybody that's, that's, uh, that's what, that's my healthy debt to pay. So that's, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm cool with that. But that bio, man, I read this little bio from you and it was really well written and it was really beautiful. But I know that you're more than that. We got a chance to chat a little bit prior uh, mm-hmm. to, to me hitting record. So if you wouldn't mind, would you give me and our listeners a little background on your life, where you've been, where you're going, the Nate Morell experience? <laughs> sure. Sure. I would love to do that. Um, so I was always kind of an, an anxious kid, and I think I was just kind of wired to be anxious. I was also sensitive and kind of hyperactive, and um, I was able to kind of cruise by school until probably ninth grade, where I had to actually start using executive function and doing homework, and I was just lost. I like My heart wasn't there. I couldn't see the purpose of it. Uh, my parents had separated at the time, so I really um, I was really just lost, really couldn't find any grounding. And I ended up going to a lot of electronic music festivals like in New York and Baltimore and Philly. And I think looking back now, I can kind of see that I was looking for some kind of connection, some kind of love and some kind of deeper connection, like a almost like a oneness or spirituality that, that I didn't have, that I didn't find in church growing up. But I was really lost and I just kind of struggled on. I switched different high schools. And th- then I found black and white photography, which I completely fell in love with. It was like this beautiful mixture of um, art and science. And I can go in the developer and watch these pictures come alive. And it was just this really meaningful thing for me. I really connected it to it. I really fell in love with it. So I went to school for photography and I was really motivated. And suddenly my grades went from F's to A's and I got a job in the field and I was traveling all around working as a photographer. And this was like a million years ago, back when there was like film that I was working with, which I don't, you know, we used to put in cameras and if it got exposed to light, it would be destroyed. So of course I did that, <laughs> like a really important account, I uh, got fired and I was just devastated. It was like the first time in my life where I wasn't working full time or in school full time and I couldn't find any uh, photography work and I was on unemployment and I just, it was really dark, like really, really dark. Uh, I was in my parents' house to make it worse, you know, <laughs> It's like everything, my whole world had had pretty much fallen apart at that point. And then I just got to this point, like, no, I can't just sit here for another day. And I called United Way and it's like, all right, here's these opportunities. So I got hooked up with um, the suicide crisis hotline with 1-800-SUICIDE and uh, contact crisis line. And where I grew up nearby, there was a center in Yardley that was 24 hours a day. So I went through this like 40 hour training to like, just not really therapy, but just like empathetic listening and active listening and just connecting with people and being there. And I filled in all of these shifts. So like within a couple of months, I probably did hundreds of hours of, of crisis you know, phone work. And I got to know people who were living with um, bipolar and people who were living with schizophrenia and all these different things. And I got to make these like really great connections. And I realized that, oh my gosh, like this is what I was put on earth to do. And um, so I signed up. I came here to Stockton. I, I went right through 
the social work program and uh, started working for hospice and then got into counseling. And it was so funny because if you had asked me when I was a child, like, would I ever be a, a social worker? I, I never would have said yes. I never thought in a million years. But it was this like beautiful way of the universe correcting itself. Like, oh, your ego thinks you want to be a photographer. Like, well, guess what? That's like completely the wrong field for you. And you're never going to realize this. So we're going to give you this opportunity to go through this pain and this darkness in order to ultimately come up to where you're, you're meant to be. And it makes sense. It makes total sense now. Like looking back, I would always get in trouble because I would just, you know, I'd be working at Target and like I get in trouble because I talk to people too much or like just too interested in people's stories. And um, that's actually because I w- just wasn't in the right path. And through that, through that being fired and through, um, you know, my own struggles and through that pain that ultimately corrected itself, you know? And, and so now when I look back to, back at it. I have this deep gratitude and love and and kind of trust that ultimately the universe is kind of guiding me to where I'm supposed to be. So now that's like a lot of my work is trying to just kind of let go when the next challenge comes up and and to acquiesce to that like more peacefully instead of um, that whole extra layer of suffering. They're like, oh, I don't want this to be this way. And why does this have to be like this? And how can I get myself out of it because, you know, the, the pain of that time, ultimately, um, it was productive pain and it was pain that was heart opening and, and connecting. So that's kind of how I ended up here. Like it, things have grown since then, but I think that's, that's how I ended up doing social work and doing counseling. There's so much juice and, and, uh, good material, lots of questions, you hit a lot of bullet points. And so I think we can end the interview here. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and click. So, Dude, I mean, isn't it funny how, or ironic, or whatever it is, mm-hmm. about how how life kind of provides this quote unquote market correction? Our personal stock is super inflated, and we think, oh, I'm going to go here, I'm doing this, and there's, I guess I'm speaking for myself, but it sounds like I'm speaking for you as well, maybe. But we're so full of ourselves, and we think we've got this. I'm like, I'm in charge, and I know what I'm doing, and I'm in control. And then the universe is like, eh, guess what? I'm in charge and you need to chill a little bit. And sometimes we've got to go through pain to learn that. And then hopefully the next time the universe needs to teach us a lesson, we won't go through that kicking and screaming, but kind of go with that flow. It sounds like you've done that. Uh, and you kind of had to learn that the hard way in a sense, especially back when you kind of lost that photography piece and, and then kind of ch- did that sort of transition into counseling. Curious about the photography for a minute. Just, I just, I just want to make a connection if, if there's any at all, but is there any way this piece of your life that involves photography, is, is there any sort of transferable skill or anything that transfers from photography to counseling, you know, whether that's, I can't even make the connection myself. I I, I kind of probably could, but you ever find that like what you learned from your life as a photographer informs what you do as a counselor? Definitely. Um, and, it, and it's one of those really cool things where like looking backwards at my life, like everything's 2020 and I could see how the pieces all happened when they did. Um, and it's this beautifully organized plan uh, going through. It's just, um, again, a work in progress, total mess, <laughs> you know, just like struggling through to make it through every day and trying to function as a human being. But like, but there's this beautiful plan that I definitely see. And well, f- photography, uh, that's a great question. I actually never been asked that before, but you have to really look at design and lighting and focus in on details and trying to connect with people and try to see people for, you know, for who they really are and let their, their kind of being shine through and try to to capture them and to um, really focus in and and pay attention to them, to um, acknowledge them, you know, and try to really see them. And I think that's therapy is kind of the same way too. You know, people want to be heard. They want to be listened to. They want to be seen. You know, I want to know that someone else sees me, you know, that they can put their phone down and they can focus in on me and they can um, validate my existence. And I feel like it's that same kind of emotional quality um, from photography moving into uh, counseling and social work. And and I think um, I use now, I use photography a lot because I do a ton of prevention stuff. I have a suicide prevention team. I have a eating disorder prevention team. And then a whole group of like positive psychology events, like gratitude fest and a taste of mindfulness and 
hmm. a program called Nourish, where I work with like organic farmers. And um, but I do all, a lot of the produ- you know the production for that and the photography and the social media. So that was a skill set that I also I took some of the the feeling behind it or some of the experience behind it and brought that into counseling. But also, I'm, photography is still very much a part of my life. It's just not um, what I'm doing to survive. It just becomes how I support loving other people and connecting other to other people and um, helping to pull other people out. That's really powerful. I, I'm glad to hear you say that because I, I, I didn't even know I was going to ask that question. And I didn't even know if you were going to say yes. Like, nope. And that's the end, <laughs> of, that, the end of that segment. I love the, the, the essence of what you bring out, first of all, when you said people want to be seen, you know, there's just kind of relating to what you're talking about, hopefully quickly. My friend Desiree has a photo project for suicide attempt survivors called Live Through This. And so there's these people telling these really dark stories about what happened and how they kind of got out of it or what they're doing to manage life now. And so you, but then it's paired with this photo and Des, Des, Desiree does a really good job of capturing who that person really is in spite of what they're talking about. And so it, that that's what you do. That's what you, so it, it, exactly with what you do, we, people do want to be seen and they want to, and you have to do that as a photographer. I suck at photography. Maybe I need to apply the skills that I'm learning and, and I'm taking a counseling course and maybe, maybe I need to do it backwards, do it, do a backwards Nate. <laughs> and then I just love when people can use their creative skills transferably somewhere else. That's what I do. You know that. Um, yeah. I'm not fully pursuing, I'm not pursuing acting or playwriting or anything like that full time or at all. It's not what I do to survive, but you know, I can sing show tunes while I'm, listening, you know, while I'm getting some administrative work done or, I mean, I still do the play when I, you know, sometimes when, when that's the kind of programming that people want and they want some suicide prevention on the back end of it. But what I do and what my creativity definitely is infused into my work. And I love to hear that yours is. And in fact, I'm even more grateful the fact that you're using these alternative methods to reach people with, with nourish and with, you know, through social media and you know, these important touch points where, where a lot of folks aren't doing that. And it's just, I think it's because there's a lack of bandwidth, but within our field, suicide prevention, mental health, we need more positive stories and, and hitting different media outlets where it's not a boring or, or sad public service announcement. Okay. So question, back to questions. So you had this experience in your life where the the universe kind of corrected your system and said, no, no, not photography, counseling. And you went through this kicking and screaming for a moment or whatever that was. And then you found that transition and you moved. Have you been through anything? I I don't, we can know the details or not know the details. I don't want to pry. This is an interview. Has that served you well going forward saying, I'm going through another correction or another correction or another correction. Like, and maybe I'm not going to be as is I'm not going to be kicking and screaming like I did when, when I made that first transition. Has that served you well? And if so, how? It's a continual work in progress. I mean, that's the ultimate goal is to still have the pain and to see the pain and, and feel it, you know, to feel my feelings fully, but not to get lost in it, not to become the pain and get kind of stuck and isolated in that, that spot. I also, um, I didn't mention this, but at the same time uh, when I was going through that kind of career transition and everything, I was getting these horribly paralyzing anxiety attacks that would happen like a half hour after I'd fall asleep every night. So it wasn't like I was walking around like thinking about stuff. I would I would go to sleep and I would just be jolted awake and you know my heart would be pounding out of my chest and I just this feeling of this is it. This is this is you dying and it would happen like every night. So um that was hell. I mean that was really you know some people face death a couple times and they die. But like, this was like every night for months. And so that was also going on during, <laughs> just like paint the context of this time. Um, but then I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm dying. I need to get ready for this. So like, who knows about death and started looking to like mindfulness meditation and I'm like, all right, well, the Buddhists, they seem to know this stuff. So I threw myself <laughs> into, into meditating. I would go on, you know, retreats and go and stay at, um, you know, meditation centers. But I had like this super intense drive because I really felt like this is it, you know, that, that any day I was, I was probably going to die and I really needed to figure out what was at the core of life, you know, what was this all about? Um, am I ready to die? Like, is my life in that place? And it was like this really, really intense drive for someone like in their early 20s. 
and it was it really it was like it's just like pain that that words don't really describe just like the terror and it's common i mean panic attacks are obviously common but um that was all that was going on at the same time and um now i look back at that with gratitude too because that drive to figure out hey like what are you doing and are you ready to die and um are you at peace with the world do you understand why we're here and what like i didn't get to to kind of wrestle with that in my 40s or 50s or 60s like it was really intense so so but now looking back at that i'm i'm super grateful for that drive because it it brought me places that i wouldn't have pushed through before um and it didn't kill me i think i got to a point where i was just finally like all right look if you're going to kill me kill me if not i'm going to go on and live and uh and it didn't and so like now you know i still get the pain i still struggle i still fall on a daily basis but um i'm detached from it a little bit where I can see it happening now. Like, Oh, okay. There's the anxious mind. Oh, there's my depressive mind. Like I could see it and not be it, you know? So it's like, yeah, there's, I'm never going to be totally away from anxiety and depression and, and all these other things I've struggled with, but like I could see them happening now and not, I'm not them. I'm not in the middle of it. It's like, Oh, okay, here it is. So it's, there's a little bit of space now, which I didn't have in my early twenties. And I'm also, I think, a lot more at peace in my own skin. That was something really beautiful about my 30s is just kind of like letting go of the work in progress and, you know, of, of thinking I was going to kind of like be something, like some perfected version of myself and just like kind of accepting myself for who I am. You know, all the whole, all my challenges and my strengths. And um, so I think I'm getting better at, <laughs> at like not <laughs> fighting the pain, but the pain is certainly still there. I'm a lot more comfortable with, with, being it and not being it now and, and having more kind of wisdom uh, with experience. And I think that when you go through something for the first time, especially if it's, if it's painful, if it's anxiety or it's depression or whatever, like you don't know that it's going to stop. You don't know what it is. And, and it's so powerful that it could almost, it could just be paralyzing or overwhelming. But, you know, the hundredth time that you've gone through something, it's a little different than the first time. So I'm every, all of my growth has been through pain, you know, <laughs> I'm just not, mm. I don't know if I'm just not evolved enough to like grow completely <laughs> through love and like just seeing other people fail and be like, oh, okay, well now I, I don't have to learn this the hard way. Like I just, there's something about me that I guess I love learning things the hard way, but slowly I'm learning and slowly, you know, it's like I'm, I keep getting up and pushing forward and, and letting go. Um, and I think that's it, you know, just love and let go. And, and I keep coming back to that, you know, a thousand times a day, love and let go, love and let go. But um, I think I'm getting maybe like a half a percentage a year, <laughs> like on a good year, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah. It's tough. I mean, life is tough. It, it's just, there's no easy ways through this. And, and, you know, even for someone whose job to like help other people and support them, it's a struggle for, for me too, on the other side, you know, on the other side of the couch. So um, I get it, you know, and I think that doesn't make me a, a bad counselor. I think being connected to that pain and very aware of where it is inside opens me up to someone coming in and them being able to go to that place too, you know, cause it's not something I'm disconnected from. It's something that I live and, um, and I could see that in someone else and allow them to, to be themselves and, and to um, just kind of hold space for that. Like, Hey, we're both here. We're both human beings. We're both struggling. We're both on this earth. You know, it's not a power differential thing. We're here supporting each other. What do we do? You know, how do we, how do we make it through this together? How do we uh, survive and thrive and, um, so it's cool. It's definitely a journey. I guess I'm getting a little bit better. I don't. I don't. You might need some like Dude. outside people to verify that or not. I don't know if I'm the best person to to verify. That. <laughs> well, my my thought process while you're towards the end of of you speaking is just that you're a beautiful person. And then there's this uh, because of because of the the mindsets the mindset and the mindsets that you choose to live by. I love the love and let go. That's that's going to be something I'm going to take with me from this from from our talk because I know I need to be reminded of that every single day, mm-hmm. every single moment probably. I, I get impatient over certain things, and then I'm thinking about the way you learn lessons. You're like, I got to learn things the hard way, and I think I think this you it just makes you human, human Nate. Because I, I feel the same way. I'm like, dude, do I really have to go through this again or something else? And every right. time I go through something, I learn something. And I think we as human beings gravitate towards comfort and we'll stay there until something kind of wiggles us or, or pries us away from that comfortability. And I'm not sure what the recipe or the, or I'm sorry, the remedy is for that, but I think sometimes we can anticipate it. And, and you somewhat alluded to that, especially when it comes from inside of our own bodies. Like, 
I can see this episode coming on. I can see that one coming on. I can see my depression coming. When and my episodes aren't these like for the most part aren't these deep in the whole kind of thing. It's just this like elongated, like almost like headache behind my eye. And so to kind of give it that analogy. And so when you see it coming and, and instead of kicking and screaming, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, maybe I'll, maybe I'll open my arms and hug you instead of like kick at you and putting your arms out to embrace that rather than, because the things will come at you anyway, it's still no, coming really. whether you kick it or not. So maybe that maybe that hug will will will, will rein it in a little bit. I love I love the fact that you saw you see those anxiety those panic attacks and what you went through in that period as an opportunity as something to be grateful for because it does it does teach you a lesson. I'm I'm actually grateful for my depression. I'm grateful for the for the difficulties I've been through. I don't want anyone else to experience them. And you and I in our collective work are trying to prevent people from suffering and needless suffering, but but I'm so glad to hear that you are a willing participant in turning the lemons in your life into lemonade, and you're like, you've got all these different recipes and different flavors, and I don't know, this might be a, a terrible analogy, but lemons in the lemonade is kind of where I'm sticking with, and um, it informs your work, it informs your self-development. I love, like, I think, I think that this, that, that what you've been through also makes you, you can relate to those students that come in at Stockton and say, I'm, I'm anxious. I'm, I'm, I've got anxiety. I don't know what to do. I've got these panic attacks. Oh, hang on. This is what I've been through. And you, you know, not to, not that you're in some group therapy session because you are still a counselor, but mm-hmm. at least you can relate to that. And you, you can, it, it, I think it grows your, your, um, your empathetic nature in a sense. Man, just, just, ex- just, I'm, I, I, I didn't know where we were going with this interview today. I really didn't. We said that prior, and, and it's just taken a, a beautiful turn and, and so much good in here. I can't wait to write out the show notes on this because there's going to be, Nate said this, Nate said that, and there's going to be a lot of juicing to it and just the epitome of what we try to cover and what we try to do on the show. So I didn't have to pull any teeth on this one. It was, it was really nice. But but I want to I change gears, Nate. Um, okay. For, for just a moment, because you have you, this, this very introspective, deep guy, and and a lot of our interviews are that way, and I, I love it. I think there's there needs to be more room for that. But I'm 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 a, I'm a silly dude, man. I'm I'm silly, you know. And 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 we gotta, you know, people with anxiety, depression. We're kind of like I think people see us as one note sometimes, and we're not one note. We you know we're a whole orchestra, a symphony, right? So this is a quick fire round, man. This is just a okay. chance for people to see a different side of you. So I'm just going to ask a couple different questions. It's kind of like our Fallon or our Conan moment. And you're you're the movie star, man. You're the you're the guy. Uh, you're the guy. You know who we're interviewing. So uh, buckle up. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. Uh, yes, Nate. What is your favorite word, man? Love. love. It's just like focusing on love is is not like a a thing, but a practice. You know, and trying mm-hmm. to to let my life just be a, a practice of love and, and kind of falling into that and keep coming back to that when someone cuts me off on the Parkway or Atlantic City Expressway or you know, <laughs> on Roosevelt Boulevard, um, mm-hmm. we're driving around Philly. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, just, it's in my language, it's in my behavior. It's like that's been the work of trying to move from a fear-based human to a love-based human. And, and anytime, like, I get that opportunity where something scares me now. I like trying to just throw myself into it and trying to come at it from a place of love and mm. um, and live that. If I'm going to try to challenge other people to live it, I have to to live it too. So yeah, it encompasses so much that word and it's like that person cutting me off. Like that's something that's been in my world too. Like, what is that person going through? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, there's no reason for me to give them the middle finger and chase them for five minutes. <laughs> well, I'm not going to catch up anyway, which I've never done, but, you know, still. Uh, no reason to get mad about it because when you, when you operate from love, it's like, okay, so what's that person going through? I might not need to hang out with that person, but at least I can show them some kindness. Love that mindset. Love that mindset. Just a, another reminder for me. Thank you. That exact situation actually happened. So I was, like, driving on the parkway, this, like, 18-wheeler gets in front of me right before the exit and I had to like slam on my brakes. And I was just like, it's called it like a, like a variation of MF or, but it was like worse, you know, like, <laughs> and, and then I'm like, you know, maybe the guy, the guy has to get off, you know, he didn't see the exit. He's late. He didn't sleep last night. He's living with depression, you know, like all of these other scenarios. Mm-hmm. And then I just said, you know, bless you, you, you MF or, you know, and I just started <laughs> cracking up and like laughing at myself, you know, like all of that anger, all yeah. of that hate, like that didn't hurt him. That just messed up my happiness. Um, yeah. So just trying to, it's like, I, it's not like I stop making mistakes, but I feel like as I get older, I'm getting better at catching them and kind of laughing at myself and, and letting things go. But it's, 
it's a gradual process. Powerful, powerful. I love that mind, that thought and that mindset that it's like anger, grudges, hate. That doesn't do anybody. I mean, unless you like act on them, but aside from that, that hurts you. It doesn't hurt the other person. That hurts you more than it hurts the other person. Uh, another good, good reminder. Um, so Nate, what is your least favorite word, brother man? Probably anything like along the lines of like, like racism. Like I don't like that N word probably. I don't like there's certain mm. words that just, I have a visceral response to It's just like, there's so much pain encapsulating the words that like, mm. it just, it like almost stop. Like when I, certain things when I hear it just like, it's almost just stops me, you know, it just like, mm-hmm. I think I'm more, um, so one of the things that's helpful to be a counselor, I think is just being really emotionally aware and, and sensitive, but there's also a, a downside that too, you know, when you hear words that were used for hate or to oppress people or to, you know, use violently, it could, you know, I feel that intensely too. And, um, see, I think I'm lucky in that I'm not, it's not like I'm in an environment where all the time I'm hearing a lot mm-hmm. of like really negative kind of racially based words, but you know, it's something that we, we deal with today. I mean, if you can't go on social, like go on social media today and see if you can avoid, uh, you know, seeing, seeing that stuff, yeah. seeing everything that's going on out there. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't know. It's yeah. I guess that's a really long answer to you. No, <laughs> it's cool. No, it's great. <laughs> Quickish fire round. You know, it, I mean, it, it totally feeds into what your favorite word is because if, mm-hmm. if it has a negative connotation, it's like a fear-based thing rather than a love-based thing. And yeah. uh, and so you, if nothing else, Nate, you might be long-winded, but you're damn consistent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have that going. So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, and and you certainly don't fit into the mold because most of our other guests said that their uh, least favorite word is either no, hate, or moist. And uh, so, um, you know, so we're uh, <laughs> maybe you are one. You know, your evolution is in different ways. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I, I dig it, man. I'm cool. And there's no right or wrong answers anyway. So if somebody made a movie of your life, Nate, the Nate Morrell story, Morrell story, excuse me, that would be uh, that would be the working title. We'll put this on, this would be like an ABC TV movie, right? Movie of the week. Who would play the title role of Nate? Oh, man. Uh, maybe like a young Gene Wilder, like from Willy Wonka. Ooh. Time. Yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> like a Mark Zuckerberg looking person. Uh, I don't know. I get all different things. My hair's super curly, so when it grows out, it I is. definitely get Willy Wonka. So, and plus, I that was one of those movies growing up where I couldn't not watch it. So, oh, like deeply dude, burned into my of, brain. Yeah, I was. Thinking, you know, you said Gene Wilder, and I my face went to Gene Hackman. Oh, <laughs> oh, like, oh okay. But yeah, young. I mean, so funny, so versatile. Yeah, yeah. Gene Wilder. I could see. I could go for that. I could go for and that. And he had that like um, kind of dark edge. There was this like really creative, mm-hmm. amazing presence he had. But then there was also this kind of like darkness there too. And I feel like you know I've had all of this beauty and love in my life, but there's also this like dark tone that's also been a theme too. So I I mm-hmm. love how all those things come together. Hmm. Yeah. His his life certainly. There's been moments. I mean, his wife was Gilda Radner. That he he helped start. Um, some some uh cancer Still charity because because he yeah yep 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 so um but then his but his like if you see him in young frankenstein and he's very silly but then there's these dark moments too and it's like oh dude where did that come from this is a mel brooks movie um but i like that well so we, if if uh you know we'll maybe do some cgi we'll get we'll get okay. on, uh... <laughs> yeah, anything's possible today right we could do anything <laughs> Seriously, I saw the new Star Wars movie and uh, one of the one of the standalone one, and they had a guy, a British guy, who was like one of the evil commanders or whatever. And I was like, "Isn't this guy dead?" And he's been dead for twenty years. And they <laughs> CGI'd his face onto somebody else, and the guy kind of did the voice and was the body, and they CGI'd his face. I was like, "This is the future of like, wow, like maybe they'll get Charlie Chaplin to do like the next Star Wars." Like, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Anyway. Just, just kind of a weird, funny. So, what do we got? Two more questions left. Nate, who or what is your spirit animal? Uh, dolphin, mm. because they're they're fun. They love water. They're smart. They're social. They love to surf. Uh, they love to play. Super they blow, smart. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, they have blowholes. They, they make for love. I'm like, blow, yeah. <laughs> they, right? Yeah. So I really feel a connection yeah, to dolphins. Cool. I love that, and that's that's mad cool. Um, I, I'm a big fan of dolphins. Uh, I got a chance to swim with them uh, last uh-huh. summer. Really, uh, really, just uh, an amazing experience. So, last question, Nate: If heaven exists, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say to you as you enter 
or as you get kicked out, one or the other. Mm. <laughs> I guess just welcome home, you know, welcome home to your true oh. nature. And now we're one, you know, and, and then mm. I could just see myself like disappearing, you know, letting go of like this Nate separate ego and just becoming one with, with God and the entire universe and this beautiful CGI effect with lights and, um, just blinding light and then just disappearing and becoming one. That's kind of, that's sometimes I picture it like that, you know, like, I mean, when we, whatever happens after we die, we just kind of blend in and become part of a tapestry again. And that, that stupid little ego goes away. Yeah, I feel that. that. Yeah. It's yeah. Even like a thought. It's like something I feel, I think that's another thing. Like as I've gotten, I've gotten a little older, it's just like letting go of like overthinking everything and just trying to connect to the feeling and, yeah, I think definitely spirituality is one of those things I struggled with when I was younger. But now I think I've opened more because I've thought less and just tried to love more and, and to open more. And um, and that's definitely something I, I can't connect with on a head level, but on a heart level, it's I'm mm. one with. I feel that too, man. I'm I'm uh, agnostic of the capital A, but I do feel that connection to the universe. Um, man, it's really cool. All right, well that's that's the end of the quick fire round or the quickish fire round. Nate, what? What do you think, man, the next, like, six months to a year holds for you professionally, personally? Like, what's going down in your world that you feel comfortable sharing about? All right. Well, this is something that I'm really passionate about, and I think it's one of the reasons I feel so connected to you, because I think we're kind of both um, on the same path. I do a lot of suicide prevention. We have a whole month coming up of events, um, and, we, and there's a lot of – there's also an eating disorder month, prevention and awareness month, and um, so – that's stuff that I do because I have to do that. I really believe in, in how precious and, and beautiful life is and, and people's ability to work through being in hell and, and to become more resilient. But my work over the last five years has been more um, kind of a, I had this amazing awakening where it was like, what, what the hell am I doing? Like I'm sitting in my office waiting for people to come in who get to the place of, of being stuck and completely isolated and having suicidal thoughts or completely paralyzed by anxiety. And now we're going to get them support. And now I'm going to to support them. And, and I think there's always going to be a place for that. But it's like the whole system that I was part of is just based on waiting till people are completely broken down. Um, I'm a mental health first aid trainer. And there's something that just completely shattered my heart was the average length of time um, that it takes for people to get help for a mental health disorder is, um, is seven years. You know, that's people's proms. That's their 20s. That's their, you know, their, their 30s. That's, that's, um, that's time we can't give someone back. And we wait until people are in that absolute period of hell before getting them support and, and trying to love them and, and support them and help them recover. But, like, this whole system is completely um, perverted. You know, it's like, why don't we start and try to get people some, you know, emotional support, get people coping skills, get people feeling their feelings and talking about their emotions and uh, connecting to other people and, and teach that from, from when kids are two or three years old. Because little kids, my daughter's four, she gets that. Another kid is crying in her class. She goes over to her and hugs her. Like she has mm-hmm. that love. She has that connection intrinsically. But I think because now we have a whole, and I see this because I work in a college, um, a lot of people aren't resilient. You know, they, they are on paper, they're amazing. You know, they're in... Um, they have a beautiful Instagram page and they have, um, you know, AP classes and they're um, involved in sports and volunteering and they're in the right college and they look great and, you know, everything's perfect, but inside they're dying from anxiety and depression um, and they can't talk about it. They're locked in that world. You know, we have these students who are really perfect on the outside, super high functioning, but we're never given resili- resiliency. We're never allowed to fail and to to grow through that failure, um, we're, we're protected and, and kept from, um, I had a student last, last fall, you know, he was really high functioning. He was a hockey player. He had lots of friends. Um, he came in and, and he was struggling and looked at me and he said, Nate, I shouldn't have to struggle. You know, and it's like, I felt like I failed him. Like we failed him as a community that he could, he could come to being 18 and go to college and never have that um, never be taught the lesson. No, it's okay to fail. It's okay to struggle. Struggles where growth and resilience are and, and that's okay. So I think with me, my whole work is to get out of my office, you know, and to um, work on, you know, gratitude fast and, and bringing people mindfulness and um, getting people. We do, we screened like close to 900 people for our suicide uh, prevention activities. We brought the therapy dogs in and we have art and we have um, a lot of supportive things, but trying to catch challenges when they're small um, and getting people supported, getting people connected 
um, and not waiting. You know, I, I think that's really the, the call. Yeah, I will do suicide prevention. If somebody is struggling and they're in that place now, I will go there with them gratefully um, and, and be with them there and hold that space for them any day of the week. You know, and I'm certainly there for that. But at what point do we wake up and say, no, you know, this whole system is wrong. You know, it's all based on a, a problem model and waiting until people are completely broken down. Like, um, we need to change that. We need to change that today. We need to get the hell out of our therapy offices and get out on the streets and, and write books and have plays and, you know, all the amazing stuff you're doing. You know, I'm trying to, to meet people who are there, there. So that's a lot of the work with Active Minds and with the Wellness Center um, and trying to give people the building blocks of wellness and help people thrive, really flourish. Not just like, okay, well, I'm not going to kill myself and, I, and I'm not paralyzed with anxiety, but I'm kind of empty. It's like, no, like I want you to flourish. Like how do we give people connections to love and to service and, um, you know, social wellness and mindfulness and gratitude, like that's the path. And I don't hear that message that many places now. So I want to bring that to life. I want to practice it. I want to bring it to life. And I want to um, do that here at the campus, but also, you know, wherever that opportunity arises. So that's kind of something super passionate about. And that's kind of been a major shift for me going from this crisis model to, to a prevention model. And so that's what I'll be doing over the next six months. Gosh, man, that's, oh, I love where your head is with that. We got to get people upstream. We got to get them before they're broken down and in crisis with whatever education, um, a hug, just, just a different way of speaking and interacting. And I think, I think our minds are in the same place on that and our efforts are in the same place on that. And man, I'm so jelly. I would love, to, I, like, I'm like, oh, you got this going on and that going on in September. And blah. I'm like, that, like, if I can get my behind in New Jersey, like, I am going to make a pit stop because it sounds like just some really cool stuff stuff going on uh, over Suicide Prevention Month. Just it's really fun, really impactful, really powerful. Dude, if, um, I don't know if, if this is a possibility, but I always offer this to every guest or, or whatever. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, follow your work, maybe help out at Stockton or help out with any of the initiatives, or they just want to say, hey, is there a good way that people can do that? Follow your work, follow you, or say hello? Is, is there a cool way to do that? Yeah, definitely. So if it's as far as our suicide prevention work, if they want to check out, um, it's on Facebook. So it's facebook.com forward, forward slash Stockton Saves Lives, like all together. Um, they can see all of our outreach efforts for the last three years there. And then also if they look up Active Minds at Stockton University, they can see all of our other outreach where we had the Gratitude Fest and Taste of Mindfulness and Nourish and Eating to Thrive and all of these other really um, events that I love as well. So you can get kind of the all right, let's let's get the darkness piece, and then we'll also get the light, and um, and kind of really see what we're up to. And then you can certainly, um, I'm the administrator on the Stockton Saves Lives page, so uh, you can send me an email in there, um, or you can look me up at the college. So uh, I'm here, and if there's other people out there that are on, you know, the same energy level that you and I are, Josh, and they're they're trying to reach out and connect, and if there's anything I could do to help help them up or to support their causes, please reach out to me because, um, you know, we're all, we're all on the same mission, you know, and I think we're all in this together. So let's pull each other up if we can, I guess. Super duper, man. I I love it. I'll I'll get all that to the show notes, but Nate, man, this was, this was really cool. I'm really glad I got a chance to do this and I really appreciate you coming on the show, man. This is really uh, a real honor and a real treat. Me, Me too. I could talk to you all day. You know, it's like when you can connect to somebody who understands and, and has the same passion for fighting stigma and connecting other people and, and helping other people. It, it's really, um, it's like therapy for me. So thank you for, uh, for, for giving me that space and, and for, for you being you, you know, I certainly, you know, everything that you are and, and that you've done. Well, that, that, that definitely means a lot. And, uh, and likewise, this is kind of like therapy for me, like getting a chance to connect and have, have a, a big person conversation and, and talk deeply. So, uh, so one more thanks again. You've been listening to the I'm Possible Project show with Joshua Rivetall and guest Nate Morell. I love sharing stories and how to turn impossible into I'm Possible. If you want more inspirational stories, our second and third books are in pre-order right now. Changing Minds, Breaking Stigma, Achieving the Impossible, as well as Lemonade Stand. Both contain powerful stories of overcoming tremendous odds. When life gives you lemons, squeeze, add sugar, and pick up a copy of The I'm Possible Project. www.iampossibleproject.com slash pre-order. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're more than a community. 
You're part of the I'm Possible family. Until next time, sending you lots of love. <laughs>